Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We are doers of it. Thank you for all that you accomplished through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We've been sharing with you most recently, the last couple Wednesdays, on the subject of the fact that we, the, the, the fulfillment of the fall feasts of the Lord by Jesus and how he accomplishes that. We talked about the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. We talked about the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And today we're going to talk about the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Tomorrow, which would be Monday, is the 15th day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. And we are to proclaim these things in their seasons, as you see in Leviticus 23, 2. Speaking of the children of Israel, say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. That's why we're proclaiming it. Not just because it's the season only, although it's an important message for everybody in the body of Christ to understand, to see the work of God be accomplished. Now, there are seven feasts. These are not Jewish feasts. These are not Old Testament feasts. These are God's feasts. And they are a revelation of the work of Jesus Christ to mankind. The first four have been fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. On the very day of Passover, he was the Passover lamb made sin. Unleavened bread, the putting away of sin, is what Jesus accomplished for the three days and three nights when he was in, went down to hell and then was the first born from the dead and then came up and went up to heaven in fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits, having been the firstborn from the dead, presenting himself unto the Father. And then 50 days later was when the day of Pentecost came, which was the fulfillment of the fourth feast. And that is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the very day of Pentecost to accomplish what the beginning of the church age, to all people who were alive at that time to be born again, receive the Holy Spirit and begin to walk with the Lord in His way and learn His ways. Now, the three final feasts in the seventh month are showing forth this, the work of Jesus in His second coming. The second coming. The feast of, these are on the seventh month. The first day is the Feast of Trumpets, which is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture. The second one is the Day of Atonement, which is on the seventh month, tenth day, which is when the judgment comes upon the earth. And we talked about the last time uh, that there's a dual fulfillment of it. The first fulfillment was in Jesus' first coming when he brought the Jubilee, which was on the seventh month, tenth day, bringing liberty to all inhabitants and bringing freedom and liberty to us and, and accomplishing his great work in his first coming. And then the final fulfillment of this will be the judgment that is going to come upon the nations. And this judgment will occur on this very day when the nations are going to be destroyed at the Battle of Armageddon when they try to fight against Jesus. That's the seventh month and tenth day. The Feast of Tabernacles is the third feast which we're going to talk about today. This is when we see the, the manifestation of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ that is going to come forth. We see in Leviticus chapter 23, we pick up here in verse 34, and he says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. The seventh month, it, seven is the number of fulfillment and completion. And it speaks of the completion and the fulfillment of God's work in the body of Christ, in your life, as well as what he's accomplished for mankind before Jesus Christ will come back and rule and reign. Fifteen is the number of rest as we are going to be entering into his spiritual rest, as we see the fulfillment of this personally in our life, and we are going to come to the place of being in the millennial reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. We see that this is seven days, <coughs> speaking of the completion, of fulfillment of what this feast is all about. On the first day will be a holy convocation. You do no servile work therein meaning that you're not going to cause this to come to pass. God is going to do the work and cause this to come to back pass. That's what it's pointing towards. 
Seven days you offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and eighth day there will be a holy convocation unto you. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It's a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. This speaks of all the offerings, and we'll talk later about the different off all the offerings that they offered up. And this speaks of the tremendous offerings that you and I are going to be engaging in, the spiritual offerings and sacrifices that we are giving unto the Lord to see the work of God be accomplished in our life to bring forth what He purposes, which is to bring us to be the glorious church ready for the coming of the Lord. We see also, verse 37, these are the feasts of the Lord which are proclaimed to be holy convocations. Offering up an offering made by fire unto the Lord, burn offering, meat offering, sacrifice, drink offerings, everything upon this day. And they all speak of the work of Jesus Christ being accomplished. We come to verse 39. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, this is the time when the fruit is gathered in, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath denoting rest, because Sabbath means rest. And we'll be talking all about this in a few minutes. And you'll take on you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. We'll be talking about what these trees are all about and how we are, it's all pointing towards what God is going to accomplish in us. And we will rejoice because of this great work that he accomplishes. You shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year, be a statute forever in your generations. You celebrate it in the seventh month, which is the time of its fulfillment. You shall dwell in booths seven days. The booths were temporary dwelling places. We'll be talking about that in a little bit as well. This all speaks of the fact that you and I are in temporary dwelling places now. But things are going to change in the future. We're going to get a brand new body. We're going to be eventually in a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to be in a new place. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. It was all physical types pointing towards the spiritual realities that were going to come through the work of Jesus Christ. We begin as we look at this. In 1 Kings chapter 8, in 1 Kings at chapter 8, we see in verse 2, The men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. This is the word that was really the original word for what the seventh month means. And it is a word which means permanent streams flowing. Permanent streams streams flowing, which is what God purposes to come to pass. It's a Phoenician word of origin. The permanent streams that are going to be flowing forth, and that is going to be the living water that is going to come forth out of the end time church. The name was changed to Tishri when it was, they went into captivity in Babylon. It's a Babylonian name. That's also when the Jews changed their year when it began. God's year begins in the first month which is the time of March or April, based on the lunar calendar. Now they changed it to the time at the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah as they call it, at a time when this, they think this is the beginning of the year, but it's not. They changed it. God's year is always begins the first month. And that is important when we see the things that are going to happen when Jesus begins to take back possession of the earth. So we see that this points towards this fulfillment of this permanent streams flowing. The living waters are going to come into the church. The church is going to grow up to maturity, and it is going to be a glorious church. And it's going to be full of power, like the early church, but even with greater glory on it, as we will see. Now, we see that it has different names that it's called. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, Verse 13, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles, it's called. Tabernacles is the word which refers to a, temp a booth or a temporary shelter, because this is a temporary dwelling place for us, not a place where we're going to stay. We're in temporary dwelling places in this body. We're going to get a new body. We're in temporary dwelling places in this earth that's bound 
by sin has been had so much destruction, there will be a brand new dwelling place that will come forth. We also see that this says that after that they should have gathered in the corn and thy wine. This means that this feast of this tabernacles, the fulfillment of it, is going to happen, or when it occurs, but also the fulfillment of it prophetically, is after the gathering in of the corn and the wine, which is the fruit that comes from all the, the planting of the crops that they had. Well, this speaks of after the fruit comes forth in the body of Christ, where they will come to maturity, and after that, that's when the fulfillment of tabernacles will occur. Corn speaks, actually, it's the word meaning the threshing floor, which speaks of all of the, the corn and wheat harvest, all that came forth in the early harvest period, which is in the spring. And then the wine speaks of that which is of the vine, wine vat or the wine press, and that was the final part of the harvest at the end of the year. So what this is speaking of is gathering in all of the fruit from the beginning, the threshing floor time, until the end, which is the entire church age, which is from the third month to the seventh month. That is the church age from the time of Siwan, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, until the time when Jesus will come back, the second coming, at the time of the seventh month. We see another scripture over in Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. He said, They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth in the mount, fetch the olive branches, the pine branches, the myrtle branches, the palm branches, the branches of thick trees, to make booze as it is written. So it's called the food, Feast of Booze, again, which were temporary shelter, temporary places that they were going to dwell. We see another meaning of it in Exodus. Another word describing it. Chapter 23. Verse 16, it speaks of the harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering. This is what it's referring to. This is the harvest, the ingathering of all the fruit, because you and I are to bring forth fruit, and the body of Christ is going to grow up, and then there is going to be the glorious church, the fruitful, mature church that it comes forth and this is in the end of the year when you've gathered in all of the labors out of the field and that's when we have accomplished this total work that we have seen that God does in our life. We also see that this particular feast has a beginning fulfillment and has interim fulfillments and then actually a final fulfillment which will come when there's the new heavens and the new earth. The beginning fulfillment we must understand is the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus Christ was not on December 25th. It is a lie. It is total deception. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word, that's the second person of the Godhead who came from heaven, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt is the word tabernacle. It's the word skeno, which means tabernacle. And so here, this is talking about and really telling us when Jesus was born. He was born at the time of tabernacles. We can see this clearly when we look at the time of his birth and the things that were occurring. In Luke chapter 2, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This is the time when there was a decree, the people were going to be taxed, and this would occur at the end of the year after all their crops were in and they had all their money so that then they could get the tax from all of their money. After this taxing was made, first made when Cyrenius was the governor of Syria, all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. That's why they had to leave and they had to come to Jerusalem and they had to come back, go back to their own city, it speaks of, where they were going to be taxed. This is at the time it was the fall of the year, not during the rainy season. The rainy season was from November to February. They didn't travel then. This is in the time of the fall, which would have been September or October, which is the time of the seventh month, which is the time of tabernacles. We go on and it says, 
Joseph went up to Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. That's why he had to go there. To be taxed with Mary as espoused wife, being great with child, she was ready to deliver. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. That's, of course, when, when she ha had the, the, the birth of Jesus. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for them in the inn. Why was there no room in the inn? Because all the rooms were taken. Why were all the rooms taken? Because everybody had to come in for tabernacles. They had to come three times a year, and this was the time of tabernacles, so all the rooms were taken up. This tells you it was the time. It wouldn't have been in the middle of the winter in December 25th, which was during the rainy season whatsoever. This shows that it was the time when, of tabernacles. Also laid him in a manger. And this particular word has been translated four times, three times as manger, but one time as stall, and this is what it's really talking about. In Luke chapter 13, verse 15, The Lord then answered and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall? Notice the word. It's the same word. You see it, crib or manger there. It's the same Hebrew word, or same Greek word. So where was Jesus born? In a stall. What was that? That was a temporary dwelling place a booth, that's exactly what Jesus fulfilled. He was coming at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is known as the Feast of Booths, and he was born in a temporary dwelling place, pointing towards he also was coming to dwell in a temporary dwelling place before he, of course, got a glorified body and went, would go back to heaven. He came down here to accomplish the work of God in order to see redemption come forth. We go back to Luke chapter 2. And we see in verse 8, There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Well, this is, means that the sheep were out in the field at this time. Well, when were the sheep out in the field? During the time before the rainy season. When the rainy season came, they brought them in. Well, the rainy season began in November. Well, that meant this is prior to November. This is in the time of October, which would have been around the seventh month, when the sheep and the shepherds were out there in the field. So we see there's five reasons listed here that we see. It's the time of the tax, which is at the time of the end of their harvest. The shepherds were out in the field. No room in the inn because it was tabernacles. Born in a stall, a Sukkoth, which is the temporary dwelling place. And also, when it said the word was dwelt among us, skeno, tabernacle, indicating the time when he was born. There's also a sixth reason that we can understand, and this is because of Luke chapter 1 and verse 24. After those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. What this is showing you, it says, the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord's with thee. Blessed thou art thou among women. Elizabeth was conceived six months before Mary was. What does that mean? Well, we take the six months plus the nine months of what it would be for carrying a child. That would be 15 months. So that means 15 months from the time that Elizabeth conceived would be the time when Jesus would have been born. One thing we do know, that Elizabeth took, had, came to full term, Luke 1, 57, Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered. It wasn't a premature birth or anything. It was a full time. Mary also was full time as well. Otherwise, it was the full six months. We know that from Luke 2, 6. It says, well, it was while they were there, the days were accomplished, fulfilled, that she should be delivered. Otherwise, the full term was accomplished. Now, how do we know when John the Baptist was born, which is what Elizabeth uh, was the mother of John the Baptist? We see in Luke chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, There was in the court days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. He was a priest. 
He was of the course of Abiah, or this is also known as Abijah. This is one of the 24 courses that they had, which the priests would have two weeks each course, 24 times two, uh, for, for it would be a half a month, two weeks, would carry out for a year, that this would be the course of Abiah when they would serve in the temple. Well, when was the course of Abiah? That's going to tell you because this is the time of when he's, the, that right after that he finished his course, that's when the, the pregnancy occurred with Elizabeth. We see over in First Chronicles the listing of these things. You know, the Word of God covers everything. It hasn't left anything out. First Chronicles 24, it speaks of the division of the sons of Aaron and all the different courses that they had when they were carrying out their service. Verse 5, they were, thus they were divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar, and they were carrying out this service of the Lord. And it speaks, it starts listing out all these different lots. There's the first lot was this one, the second lot to that one, third lot to this one. We come down to verse 10, and here's the eighth lot to Abijah. And remember, he was of the, of the course of Abijah. Therefore, it would have been the eighth lot, or eighth, the eighth course was when he, this would, he would have been serving, and that's when he would have been born. Well, it's a half a month for each one. So, one, the first two would be one month, the second two ne next month. We come to the eighth, that's going to be the second half of the fourth month. Second half of the fourth month would mean, in the Hebrew calendar, would be that's the time of July, the beginning of July, sometime in July. You go 15 months from July, and where do you come to? October. That is the time when Jesus was born. That was the beginning fulfillment. Jesus was born at Tabernacles. That's why we have nothing to do with the pagan holiday of December 25th, which is all about paganism. If you haven't read our book on it, you ought to read it and understand that it is, none of it is of the Lord whatsoever. There is a second fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, and that is the fulfillment of the work of God in the church prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at that in, in detail of the things that are accomplished because this is what God is accomplishing in you and me in the church. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, this was known as the Feast of the Open Book where they were to hear the Word of God. We see in, Luke, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses wrote this law delivered it in the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord unto all the elders of Israel. He commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, and the solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles. They had to do this at the ta Feast of Tabernacles. It's pointing towards what God was purposing to bring forth in the church to be fulfilled right before Tabernacles comes to pass. And that was... When all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God, the place he shall choose, they read this law before all Israel in their hearing. They were supposed to hear the word of God in their hearing at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, meaning the word of God is to come to us and the word of God is to be heard by all of us and we're to get the word in us and begin to walk in it to learn the ways of the word of God. Gather the people together, men and women and children, the strangers that's within thy gates, that they may hear that they may learn and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. Again, speaking of the word that's to come into you, and you are to be a hearer and a doer of it, you're going to have the fear of the Lord, you're going to learn the ways of the Lord, you're going to walk in it. And that your children, which have not known anything, may learn, hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. Your children are to learn it too. You need to teach your children the word of God. They are to learn it, they are to have the fear of God and do it as well. As long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. Well, they were obedient to do this. It came to pass, and Moses made an end of writing the book of the law, this law, uh, those words of this law in a book until they were finished. He commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the, of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So it was in the ark 
and they had to take it out every time of tabernacles and read it, and they'd put it back in until the next time of tabernacles. It's pointing out towards the fulfillment of the revelation of the Word of God in the end time church that was going to bring the church to the place of growing up, learning the ways of the Lord, having the fear of God, and walking in His ways. We see this also shown in Nehemiah chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7, we pick up with verse 73. So the priests and the Levites, the porters, the singers, some of the people, and Nethanims and all Israel dwelt in their cities when the seventh month came. Anytime you see the seventh month, you know it's talking about something to be fulfilled in the end time church right before Jesus comes. And the children of Israel were in their cities. All the people gathered themselves together as one man, showing that the body of Christ is going to come into unity in line with the word of God, those of the remnant into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. When were they to do this? At Tabernacles. Get it and bring it out because it's got to be read, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month, showing this is when it was, and this is showing that this is the fulfillment of this work that is to happen in the end time church to hear the word of God, to grow up, to get understanding, and to walk in the ways of the Lord. Verse 3, he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning till midday. Before the men and women and those that could understand in the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. God wants you to be attentive to the Word of God and learn the Word of God. You must learn the Word of God. Be hearers and doers of it in these last days so you grow up and bring forth fruit, possess promises, overcome, walk in the ways of the Lord. And notice, it was from morning. The word morning refers to the light of day or talking about dawn or daybreak. Well, that'd be like about six in the morning. Until midday. Well, that would have been the time, it would be noon, 12 o'clock. Well, that's like six hours. These people, they got the word out and they sat there and were attentive to it and listened to it for six hours. Six hours in a row of hearing the word of God. They wanted to hear the word. Those who are going to see this work of God done in the end time church are going to have a strong desire to hear the word of God. If you don't have a strong desire to hear the word of God, there's something wrong. You should want to be in the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, applying the Word, learning His ways, having the fear of God, working out your own salvation, getting the true teaching of the Word of God and the Word in you. Because it's how God works everything in your life, through the Word. We see another thing that as they were hearing the Word, of course they had to learn this and be doers of it, getting the true doctrine. We see another aspect of this fulfillment at the time of tabernacles. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 1, he says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. This is his word, the teaching, the true doctrine. It's going to come like rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. What does it do? It's coming and the rain comes to begin to bring the, the maturity of the crops for the harvest, which is going to happen. God's word is to be first place in your life. Even back in Exodus chapter 16, when they were in verse 4, and coming, coming out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness and the Lord said to Moses in verse 4, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And who, what was this? This is really speaking of the word of God. The people should go out and gather a rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Because later we see, of course, in the New Testament, who's the bread from heaven? Jesus, the word. And what happens? You and I are to get a certain rate every day. That's all type pointing towards you are to get the word in you every day. And notice, he says that I'm going to prove them, test them, whether they'll walk in my law or not. Of course, how could you walk in it if you don't know it? But if you're hearing the word every day and you're gathering it, you're expected to do it, to walk in it, to carry it out in your life. 
And God is testing all of us. Are you in the Word daily? Are you hearing the Word? Are you doing the Word? Are you applying it and put it in operation in your life? God is proving us and testing us all. What are you doing with His Word? Are you getting His Word in you and walking in His ways? We see in Isaiah chapter 55, this rain that is coming, and this is this end time pouring out of the Word of God and bringing the true doctrine of Jesus Christ is going to come forth. Isaiah 55, verse 10. As the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Notice, it's going to bring the maturing of it. it causes the bud, grow up. So shall my word be that groweth, goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It's going to do a work in you. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. It's to accomplish a work in you and to prosper in your life, to bring forth fruit, to bring forth victory, to, to bring forth uh, you coming out of the ways of sin, walking, possessing the promises, and seeing God accomplish this great work in your life. This is the revelation of the word that's going to come forth. We see also over in Proverbs chapter 16, as this rain is coming, and this is this latter rain that's going to be poured out on the end time church. Proverbs 16, 15. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as the cloud of the latter rain. This is the latter rain that brings the maturing of the crops. That's what God wants. And those that come to maturity are going to see the favor of God upon them in their life because the word of his grace will be building you up to possess your inheritance, as it says in Acts 20, verse 32. You're going to see God's favor through the Word working in you. At the same time, it's also going to require repentance from sin and walking in the ways of the Lord. You cannot continue to walk in sin and see this work be accomplished in your life. Amos 4 Verse 6, he says, I've also given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, but you have not returned unto me. They didn't repent. They didn't come back to the Lord. And also I have withhold the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. The rain is bringing forth the, the growing up of the growing of the plants, bring them to maturity for the harvest. Notice, it rained in some places, but not in other places. And why did he withhold the rain from them? As he says, causing not the rain upon another city, one piece was rained upon, and the piece thereupon it rained, not withered. Two or three cities have wandered to one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet, you have not returned unto me. They wouldn't return to him. They wouldn't repent and get themselves right with the Lord. And they all these judgments came upon them. You must understand, as we talked about, judgment is going to come to the church before it comes to the world. And this judgment that comes to the church is going to separate those who are going to walk in the ways of the Lord from those who aren't. The ones who, of course, are going to pass the test are the righteous, as we have talked about out of 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. At the same time, those who don't will be in the fallaway crowd, the apostasy that we talked about out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They'll apostatize and fall away and turn away. Unfortunately, that's going to happen because there's only going to be a remnant that are going to respond. Remember, the many are walking the broad way to destruction, but the few are walking the narrow, straight way to bring forth fruit that leads to life. Well, look at all the judgments. They got smitten with blasting and mildew in their gardens and their vineyards, the fig trees and olive trees increased. The palm worm devoured them. Everything got devoured. Why? Because they weren't walking in the ways of the Lord. And yet still, even when they saw the judgments, they didn't return unto him. This speaks of the fact that the rain is withheld and judgments will come on those who do not have repentance in their life. If you do not have repentance and you do not turn away from sin, you're going to be in trouble. Lawlessness abounding will cause the love of many to wax cold. And lawlessness is sin. And you will come to the place where you could easily be in the fallaway crowd. 
Now, we're not going to be that. We're going to be the people that are going to hear and do the word and walk in the ways of the Lord so God accomplishes what he purposes. We see in Joel another thing. In chapter 1, and this is verse 10, notice what he says. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, the corn wasteth, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. No crops, no fruit, no rain. That meant they weren't growing in the things of, the type of growing in the things of God. If we're not growing up and everything just dries out in our life, we wither away, we're not walking in the ways of the Lord, we're going to be in trouble. He said, be ashamed, O you husband, how you vine dressers for the wheat and for the barley, that's their crops, because the harvest of the field is perished. They were not following the Lord, see. The vines dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Who are the trees? A type of. We are. We are the trees. The reason we know this is because it talks of, calls us the trees of righteousness in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, when it says that they, this is talking about what the work of God accomplished in us, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, which is what? The planning of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Well, how is God accomplishing this in you? through the planting of the word in you, the word of righteousness that you hear and do and walk in so you bring forth the fruits of righteousness. You and I are to be trees of righteousness that he might be glorified. Those are the only ones that are going to come forth. And their joy, remember, the joy had withered away. Well, why didn't they have joy? Because they didn't have the word in them at all. Jeremiah 15 tells you how you get true joy. It's from the, not based on circumstances. It's from the Lord and from His Word in you. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found. That means you got in the Word. You've been seeking after Him. Find Him means you've been seeking to find something. You've been studying. And I did eat them. I took them inside of me. I digested them. They became a part. I, I absorbed them within. And the Word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Because that's where it gets into your heart to cause you to have the correct motivations, to cause you to bring forth fruit and accomplish the things that God wants. That's how you're going to have joy. We see another scripture that's important to understand, and this is really prophetic of the end times, especially in dealing with the Jews, but also of the time period from the time of the fulfillment of the first four feasts there when we see what happens. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, speaking about the Jews, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, that meant there were judgments, but he will heal us, he'll restore us if we repent. He is smitten with judgments, but he will bind us up if we repent and get right with him. We come back to him, he'll heal us and restore us. After two days, he will revive us. When did the two days begin? They began when the church age began, which is in 30 A.D. After those first four feasts were fulfilled, began the time of the church age, began in 30 A.D. A day is a thousand years, it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Two days is 2,000 years. That is the church age. Remember, there were four days, 4,000 years from Adam up to the time of Christ when he accomplished the redemption and brought men out of spiritual death into spiritual life. And the two days is the 2,000 years of the church age. Those are the six days of man's rule on the earth. And we talked about this before the seventh day, which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the 7,000 year period. After two days, that's after two days, after this 2,000 year period is over, <clears throat> he will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. This is what's for the Jews and what God was going to do is the gospel is going to be preached to them in the last three and a half years, this last part of the dealings of God with the Jews. The 70 weeks, 69 and a half weeks have been elapsed. They've been fulfilled. There's only three and a half years left, one half week. And the gospel is going to be preached to the Jews during the tribulation period, which is three and a half years, not seven years. It's total error. It's three and a half year period. And so... When's the two days over? 
2,000 years from 30 A.D. is 2,030. That's 11 years away. We are approaching that. You say, well, could that really be? Look at what's going on in the world. Look at the rise of the homosexuals. Look at the rise of the lawlessness. Look at the unrighteousness. Look at evil men getting waxing worse and worse. And you're going to see it increase as we go down these days. At the same time, the church is going to grow up and is going to come to maturity, fulfillment of what the seventh month is all about, to see the glorious church come forth because the light's going to get lighter while the darkness is going to cover the entire earth with all the people that are, have rejected the Lord. And they're going to get worse and worse. And you're going to see that happen as we go through the 20s. In the third day, he says, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. That's a condition. You must follow on to know him. Is going forth prepared as the morning, as the dawn. He's going to come. And he shall come unto us. How's he going to come to us? As the rain. The rain of the word of God is coming. As the latter and the former rain upon the earth. That's the double portion rain that is going to be poured out on the end time. It's going to be poured out on the church as well as the time for the Jews who are going to be all Israel. It says in, in Romans 11 that all Israel is going to be saved. So, this is going to happen. And this is not just a little rain. This is a shower. The shower is going to come of the latter, which are the spring rains, to come and to this former, this uh, la, uh, watering the earth, this former rain, watering the earth, which is going to water us, and we are going to grow up to maturity. We see something else in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. How am I going to sow to myself in righteousness? Well, I get the word of righteousness, and then I do the word, I speak the word, I act on the word, I pray the word, I do all these things according to righteousness, according to the word. What's going to happen? You're going to reap in mercy. You're going to see God's mercy, which is the love of God in action towards you to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to bring victory, to bring all of the things that he purposes for you in your life. Break up your fallow ground. What's the fallow ground? That's the untilled area that hasn't been dealt with in the ground. Well, what's the ground a type of? The ground's a type of the heart. God is coming to you to deal with everything that's in your heart. There can't be any untouchable areas. All the untilled areas where things haven't been dealt with, where you haven't come to the line with the word and come, come out of sin and come to the place of walking and be fruitful, it's got to be dealt with. It's time to seek the Lord. Definitely, this is the time for you to be seeking the Lord with all of your heart, seeking Him and putting Him first place in your life. Till He come and rain righteousness upon you, which are the fruits of righteousness that will come from the Word that is working in your life. We come over to, as this rain is coming, you also must understand as it brings maturity to the crops, it's going to bring maturity of the rain of the doc, true doctrine of the Word. It's going to bring maturity in your life. And it's going to come to us to the place where you are going to become as a river. That means you're going to be full of the water. Psalm 65, verse 9. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enriched it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn, which thou hast so provided for it. That's the fruitfulness. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. This is what he is going to accomplish. The river of God is coming. God is coming to visit us, to water us, to bring forth what he purposes. Because he's going to have a glorious church. He's going to have a church that is strong and mighty before it's going to be presented unto the Lord. Not one that's all weak, beat down, and not walking in victory. We come to Psalms 46, and we see something important to understand. Psalms 46, verse 4. There is a river. This is the river that's going to come into the church. 
the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. And the city of God is you and me, essentially, as he is coming to, we are the corporate city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, where he's going to come and abide. He's going to come and dwell. And notice it talks about tabernacles, because that's when all this is going to be fulfilled. Tabernacles of the Most High, is God coming to dwell in you and to accomplish his great work, to bring that river in you? And these streams from the river are going to flow out of you. Rivers of living water are going to come flowing out of you. Now, when all is this going to happen? Well, let's go back. In Psalms 46, it's quite a psalm. It says, God is your refuge and strength, a very present help in, in trouble. It will be a time of trouble. Though, therefore, will we not fear, though the earth be removed? That means the earth is going to be uh, removed, changed around. Though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea. Oh, that's, that's like a bunch of earthquakes and destructive things. The water is thereof a roaring. That's all the seas roaring and, and being troubled. And though the mountains shake, that's earthquakes again with the swelling thereof. That means this is a time when there's great havoc coming to the earth. And you'll see further prophecies about that in a little bit. Notice, he said this river that's coming, verse 5 tells us, God is in the midst of her, in this city of God, the tabernacles of the Most High, the river of God, the streams that have come in to us and are flowing out of us. God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. We're not going to be moved by all the things that are happening because the things in the world are going to be going crazy. In fact, the Bible even talks, we'll come back in a moment, the things that are going to be happening as it talks about in Luke chapter 21, over in verse uh, 25. There'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and the seas and the waves roaring. That's what's going to happen. Men's heart failing them for fear, for looking for the, after those things which are coming on the earth. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. It's going to be a time that, like the earth, has never experienced. At the same time, you, having grown up and come to the place of maturity in the Lord and seen his total work be accomplished in you, you are going to not be moved. God's in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and shout that right early. From the very break of all this to happen, the very beginning, God will be there. The heathen raged. The nations raged. Ah, because the judgment's coming. The kingdoms were moved. He utters his voice and the earth melted. Well, that's going to happen. This is talking about several things. The heathen raged. That's when the judgment's coming. The kingdoms were moved. They're all going to be eliminated. At the fulfillment of this, the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ as he takes back the rule and the reign over the earth. And he utters his voice and the earth melted. This speaks of the end of the millennial reign when there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. It is going to be eliminated. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He is with us. Come, behold the works of the Lord and what desolations he hath made in the earth. It's going to be a time of great judgment. The church will be protected while the, war, by, while the judgments are coming upon the entire world. Remember, it's all the type is shown when all the judgments came upon Egypt. Remember all the plagues that came upon Egypt? Yet the people of God were protected in the one place in Goshen. God will protect us while the judgments are coming on the earth. And you're going to be at peace because you understand these things. and You're going to know what's happening. These are the desolations, and this is the judgment that he is going to bring. And when all this is all done, here it says he makes the wars to cease unto the end of the earth. Because in the millennial reign, Jesus will be ruling, there won't be any wars. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in asunder, he burneth the chariot with fire. There won't be all this war and all this weapons of war. It will be all eliminated in the millennial reign of Jesus. But this river, it's coming. It's got to come into you to be the city of God, the tabernacle of the Most High, who's going to manifest himself mightily. 
Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 14. The Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp. The camp's a type of the church. He's coming in the church to find out whether you're going to walk in the ways of the Lord or not. And also to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. He wants you delivered from all evil spirits and all of their activities. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. Well, if you're going to see God deliver you, you've got to be holy. If you're walking in sin, you're not going to get delivered. You're going to be taken down by the enemy. You've got to be holy. That he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. The word unclean means being naked. It's the word for nakedness, meaning you're not clothed. Well, if you're not clothed, that means you haven't dealt with the sin, and you haven't gotten the word of God in you, and got clothed with the, with the garments of God, and seen the fruitfulness and all the things that God wants, the garments of righteousness, the robe of righteousness, the garments of all the different things, the putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, all the garments that he wants. is all the things of the word of God. If he sees this nakedness in you, because you haven't done what he said, he will turn away from me. But he's not, those ones who are clothed, he's, those are the ones he's going to manifest himself to. Look what it says in Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 21. Speaking of the work of the Lord, we go back here, it says, we're no more strangers and foreigners, but we're fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. We are citizens. Citizens from where? From heaven. You're not a citizen of this place anymore. You're born from above. You're a citizen of heaven. We're fellow citizens with the saints, the holy ones, and the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus himself, Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, the building is the church, fitly framed together, all growing up in one accord, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. You and I are to grow up to be a holy temple in the Lord. No sin, no works of the flesh, nothing of the world. We're walking in the ways of the Lord. We have fruit. We show forth that we're following Him by our works and all the things that we do. In whom also you are builded together, this is a corporate deal that God's bringing, for a habitation of God through the Spirit. He's coming to inhabit us. He's coming to make us a boat in us. Because he says he not only comes to dwell in us, but he comes to walk in us. That's why we can't be touching the unclean thing. We've got to set the boundaries and stay away from the things that are evil. Now, as we do this, he's going to come and make his abode, his habitation in us. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter. This is double portion rain in his season. He reserveth unto us this appointed weeks of the harvest. In other words, the fear of the Lord is what is necessary for having this rain, this double portion rain being poured out. And when's it going to be poured out? On the end time church. That means those that do not have the fear of God, they aren't going to get the rain. You've got to meet the conditions to see God's reign coming to you in your life. In Jeremiah 31, verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. Declare it in the isles afar off and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore shall he come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord. And then it talks about all this crops that are going to, which is the harvest of the crops, the wheat, the wine, and the oil. For the young of the flock and the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. That means all the fruitfulness is going to come. Your soul is going to be as a watered garden. You're going to get healed. You're going to get restored. You're going to be watered garden is, is like a saturated garden. That means that you have gotten those, the water coming into you, which is type of the word. You have grown up. You have come to maturity. And even no more sorrowing anymore because you grow up and go on into perfection in the Lord. Therefore shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both the young men and old 
together. I'll turn their mourning to joy, comfort them, make them rejoice from their sorrow. God's going to turn everything around. And I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness. You'd have a fat soul. And my people but shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. This is prophetic of what he's going to do in the end time church. This satisfying of what God wants is also seen in Joel. As we go back to Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, we see, he starts, it talks about in verse 1, blow you the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Try and get everybody's attention. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, it's nigh at hand. The day of the Lord, it's coming. Verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Otherwise, get yourself in order. Verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. In the midst of these judgments that are going to be coming, there's going to be great things that are going to happen. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth for her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Who's the fig tree nation? Israel. Who's the vine? The church. Remember, Jesus said we're branches grafted into the vine. The vine is Jesus. This is talking about Israel coming to be born again, the Jews, and the church at the same time growing up and being strong. They're yielding their strength. They're coming to be strong and mighty. That's what's going to happen. Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain. This rain that's coming to cause us to grow up of the Word of God, see, spiritual rain from the Word. It says moderately. It's not a good translation. The word here for the rain, moderately, if you notice, it means teacher, and this word is the word for righteousness. Why they translated that beyond me. It's the word translated righteousness 128 times, justice, right, righteous acts, righteously. Only time moderately, one time, how they come up with that, who knows. This is the teacher of righteousness, because what's the teaching? We're going to be taught the ways of righteousness from the Word of God, and we're going to hear and do it and bring forth the fruits of righteousness. And notice, he's going to cause to come down for you the rain. This is the shower again. The former rain and the latter rain. At first, this is really meaning, in the beginning at the first. Not month. That's error. There is no word for month there. Notice it's, it's italicized. That means it's not in the, in the Greek or in Hebrew. It's been added by the translators. They just thought that's what it said. They're wrong. In the first, which also means at the beginning, it's going to come. This rain is going to come to mature the church. And the floor shall be full of wheat. The fat shall overflow with wine, wine and oil. Well, that's tremendous crop harvest. That's what's going to happen in you and us. You and me, we're going to come to the place of growing up and have tremendous fruit in our life. I'll restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm, caterpillar, palm worm, great army that sent among you. This means all the judgments that cause destruction. God's going to restore all the things when they get right and start walking in the ways of the Lord. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord of God that dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. You're not ashamed when you triumph over your enemies. That means you're going to triumph over all of your enemies. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Of course, Israel is, who, who's the Israel? It's the, the people of God, not just Jews, but Israel, the Israel of God in, Isaiah, in Galatians 6.16 6, is the church now. And that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. In other words, you're going to make Jesus Lord of your life there ain't going to be any idols or anything else above him. You're going to put him first place, nothing else. It shall come to pass afterward, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. This is end time pouring out. It began in Acts. That's He said, this is what Joel prophesied. That's right, there was a beginning fulfillment of that. But there was also an end time pouring out of the spirit, which is the double portion spirit. And he talks about this pouring out of the Spirit. And you know this is the end time because he shows wonders in the heavens, the earth, the blood, the fire, and the pillars of smoke. 
and the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. This is talking about before the end. He says, It will come to pass, whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. You are going to call on the name of the Lord, and God is going to bring his deliverance to you. In Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. The remnant who will follow the way of the Lord. Unfortunately, there's only going to be a remnant that are going to listen to him. The rain speaks of revelation from being taught the word, coming to the place of restoration, fruitfulness, prosperity, conquering, overcoming all your enemies, God's work done in you, tremendous fruitfulness in your life, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, deliverance in all areas. That is what God is bringing forth in the church to get you ready to be the glorious church in this end time mighty army to see the great harvest of souls as well as to be ready for the coming of the Lord. This harvest time, remember the purpose of the rains is to ripen the crops for the harvest and God is going to bring all of this forth. One of the things we must realize is that also, as we saw about these booze, the booze were the trees, and we saw this in Nehemiah. You and I are going to become as these booze. Because the trees are pointing towards what God is going to accomplish. Nehemiah 8.14, here's when the children of Israel were dwelling in booze in the feast in the seventh month. These are temporary shelters. When they have these booze that they made, it was what, when all the harvest was in, they made these booze from all these different trees. And we see that these trees were made from, um, here's some, in verse 15, they're to go forth in the mountain and fetch the olive branches, the pine branches, the myrtle branches, the palm branches, the branch of the thick trees to make booze. These are all the different trees. You and I are the trees of righteousness. And these trees speak of the things that God is going to accomplish. We also see these trees listed out over in Leviticus chapter 23 in verse 40. You shall take on the first day the boughs of goodly trees. Goodly trees. Goodly trees are those that have splendor and honor and glory. This speaks of the glorious church. You and I, the trees of righteousness, are going to come to the place of being beautiful, honor, full of glory. The glorious church is going to come forth. It also had the palms and all these different ones. The palms, what is it about the palms? In Psalms 92, we see over here in verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. The palm tree that it's talking about is the date palm. The date palm was a Judean date palm that would grow in that particular area and it was renowned for its long-lived seed of hundreds of years. The date palms, once they were planted, it took them four to eight years after the planting before they would begin to bear fruit. That speaks to the fact it's going to take time in your life to bear fruit by hearing and doing and hearing and doing the word and growing up and learning the ways of the Lord. The mature date palms, when they came to maturity, they would produce 150 to 300 pounds of dates per harvest season. Tremendous fruitfulness. And they would not ripen all at the same time. But there were, continue, there were several harvests required, continual harvest, otherwise continual fruitfulness. You take these, this group, and then another month you take more, and another month you take more. They kept on a continual harvest of fruit. What does that speak of? That means continual fruitfulness in your life, and not just a little bit of fruit. Great amount of fruit. Tremendous fruit. And this was fruit continually. Speaking of what God is going to bring forth, as you're going to be like the palm, you're going to be one who's going to be tr have tremendous fruit. Also, those ones that were the thick trees that we talked about were those that were leafy and dense, mature trees that grow up and become strong. You know, if you're leafy and you're full of all foliage, that means you've grown up. The thing has matured. That is what we're going to come to the place of. There were the myrtle trees. 
The myrtle trees also speak of something about this end time church. And we see this spoken of in Zechariah chapter 1 about the myrtle trees. In verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood upon the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. Behind him there were red horses speckled in white. So he's talking about the myrtle trees. We come to verse 10. The man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, when he asked about what they were, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. Because it's talking about the ones that were there, that they're seeing. Now, who's, who's walking to and fro throughout the earth? We are preaching the gospel, evangelizing the world. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness before the end comes. And they answered, the angel of the Lord stood among the myrtle trees, said, We've walked to and fro throughout the earth. Behold, all the earth sit as still and is at rest. This shows the fact that these are the ones that are going to go forth and preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world. Also, olive trees. Olive trees spoke of the light from the anointing, the anointing of God upon them. There were also the willows. It's interesting about the willows. The willow trees, willows are trees that grow by streams of water. And they have toughness of wood. They're long, strong, interlacing roots. Their roots spread out wide. The willows by the streams of water protect the bank against the action of the water because of the large, strong, widely spread roots. That means you're going to have such strength that you're going to be protected from the waters that would try to bring any kind of destruction. You're going to be spiritually tough against any pressure, any attacks, any temptations, anything that the enemy would bring against you. That's why those willows grow by the waters and they're not affected. They're not, they're not taken down or adversely affected by them. Another thing that we see is the fact that now that we are the temporary dwelling place. The booths were temporary dwelling places. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. It speaks about all these that died in faith, not having received the promises, having seen them afar off, or persuaded them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers, and they were pilgrims in the earth. They didn't receive the promises. They, they were simply strangers and pilgrims. They were temporary dwellers on the earth. They recognize that. That's what you and I are as far as for the season. First, P, uh, First Peter 1.17, you call on the Father who without respect to person judges according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning. You're dwelling here in fear. I mean, you're just a sojourner. Remember, where are you born from? From heaven. You're going to live after heaven's ways. And what's eventually going to happen? There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, and the Father's going to come down, and we're going to dwell with him in the new Jerusalem. That is where the end result is going to come to. That's what God wants. And we are going to get, remember, glorified bodies. We're in temporary dwelling places, but we're not going to keep this. It's, we're going to get a brand new body. 2 Corinthians 5. We know if our earthly house of the tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We're gonna, we want to get that glorified body. If so be that we be enclosed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, be in burden, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality subject to death, subject to sickness, disease, all these things, might be swallowed up of life and because we're, we're going to get a brand new immortal bodies, praise God, glorified bodies. Well, this is fulfillment. It's a tremendous fulfillment. It's going to happen through the work of God in your life. We come over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It talks about you and I are lively stones. We are being built up. This is a present tense verb, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And notice what we're to be doing. We're to be offering spiritual sacrifices. Sacrifices are a giving out of yourself in some capacity, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We praise and worship Him. 
we do all the things that he wants us to do in worshiping him and giving out to others and ministering to others. We make our lives a sacrifice unto him. But we must also understand that the sacrifices also go back to what they were doing in the Old Testament in Second Chronicles chapter 4 in verse 6. Solomon's temple, which is what this is talking about here, is the end time, type of the end time church work being accomplished to bring it up to maturity. He's talking about the lavers that they had, which is where they were washed. He made also ten lavers, put five on the right hand, five on the left to wash them. Such things they offered for the burnt offering, they washed them, and the sea was for the priest to watch, wash in. Made the ten candlesticks of gold according to their form. The lavers were for washing. The candlesticks were light, which speaks of illumination and revelation that was going to come, is what that speaks of. And then we come... They made the ten tables. This was the showbread where they would eat from, which is the nourishment coming. Place them in the table. They had ten of them in there. That's not what they had in Moses. In Moses' tabernacle, they had one of them. But in this one, they put ten of them in there. Ten labors, ten candlesticks, ten tables, tables of showbread. That points to the work in the church where there was a tremendous amount of sacrifices being offered continually, and also they were having tremendous amount of all this washing that was going forth, the illumination that was going forth, the candlesticks, and also the nourishment, the feeding of the Word of God is what all this speaks of. There'll be tremendous cleansing in your life. You've got to be cleansed of all sin, all the fleshly works, the demons cast out. That's the labors, spiritual cleansing. And by the way, 10 is the number of divine order, I meaning you're going to come into divine order. That's why I had 10 of them. It's going to do a total work of cleansing to bring the church to completion and perfection, to be cleansed out. And then there's this, the, the spiritual nourishment, getting the word of God into also the, uh, the, the illumination that comes as well to us. We are going to grow up in all these things. We're going to come to the light. We're going to walk in the Word. We're going to be fed the Word of God. We're going to, our soul is going to be fat. We're going to grow up in all things. And we come down to chapter 5. This is when Solomon, all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. This is all pointing towards the finishing of the work of God in the end time church. And this is done in the seventh month. They did all this. They brought them all up. See, it's verse 3. All the men assembled themselves, the king and the feast, in the seventh month, when all this was done, the total work being accomplished. Verse 9. They drew out the staves of the ark. The ark, didn't, the, the ark used to be carried around by staves from place to place. They took the staves out, meaning it's not going to move anymore because God's presence has come into the church and we're going, he's going to abide in us. He's going to... We're going to grow up in all things and become this mighty, end-time, powerful, glorious church. Verse 11, came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, where they got sanctified, they were sanctified and become holy. God's going to do the work in you to get you to the place of being holy before him. Then it says, the Levites, the singers of all them of Asaph and their sons, they were arrayed in white linen. White linen is righteousness meaning you are going to come to the place of having righteousness. That's your whole, whole being is going to be full of the word and the fruits of righteousness. Having salt, cymbals, psalteries, harps, stood at the east end of the altar with them 120 priests. 120 in scripture is the number of the change from one age to another. How many were in the upper room? 120. The change from the Old Testament age to the New Testament age. How many are here at the end of the seventh month? 120 are blowing the trumpets. It's the change from the church age to the millennial age of Jesus Christ. Before this happens, though, what's going to happen? It came to pass the trumpeters and singers were as one. We are going to become one in one accord, the remnant. Make one sound to heard in praising and thanking the Lord. You're going to be a praiser and worshiper. They lift up their voice with the trumpet, cymbals, instruments, and music, and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house, 
that's the church, the end time remnant church, was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. What cloud is this? The glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The glory of the Lord is going to fill the church, the end time church. At the same time, the world is going to be dark as ever. It's going to get worse and worse. If you think it's going to get better, you're not thinking right. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That's right. It's going to rise upon the end time church. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. Yeah, the world's going to get worse and worse, darker and darker. The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. The glory is going to be manifest. That's the mighty presence of God. The Gentiles, the nations, shall come to the light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. People are going to come to the Lord. Yet there'll be those who reject him, the nations. The one world order will be on the scene at that time, and they will be, of course, fighting against everything that God is doing. But at the same time, God's going to be bringing the judgments that are going to be coming on the end time, on the world at the end time. It's going to be a terrible situation. This brings us to Haggai. His prophecy is important to understand. This is where it talks about the building of the house of God. Haggai 1 2 says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time's not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. The Lord's house is his work in us. People that sit there and don't want to yield to what God wants to see this done, uh, they're off. They're missing the whole boat. Uh, he comes to them and says, Uh uh-uh. uh, you're dwelling in your sealed houses, and this house is lying waste. Otherwise, you aren't building the house of God. Consider your ways. You sow much and bring in little. Well, that's not prosperity. You have nothing, you, you, and you have, but you, you eat, but you have not enough. You drink, you're not filled with drink. You clothe, but there's none warm. You're earning wages, but you earn wages with a bag with holes. It's all leaving. Well, that's not any blessing whatsoever. Consider your ways. Otherwise, you're not walking the right way because you're not seeing God's blessing in your life. Go to the mountain, bring wood, build the house, and I'll take pleasure, and I'll be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when it brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord? Because of mine house that's waste. Otherwise, judgment was coming on them because they weren't doing what God wanted them to do. And you run every man into his own house, meaning they were selfish as ever. Anybody that's a selfish Christian is going to go down in the last days. Only those that are living unto him are going to be walking uprightly and see the work accomplished. And notice, because they were selfish, the heaven over them was stayed with dew, the earth is stayed from her fruit, no fruitfulness, no rain, no blessing. I called for a drought upon the land. That's judgment. And upon the mountains, the corn and the new wine and oil and all upon the ground brought forth, and upon men and cattle and all the labor of their hands. No fruitfulness whatsoever. That's judgment. And then he comes to verse 12. And he speaks of these ones with the remnant of the people. There will be a remnant who will listen. This is going to be the glorious church, the few who are going to obey. Obey the voice of the Lord their God to start building this house, which is the spiritual house of God in you. They had the fear before the Lord, meaning they're going to now walk in the ways of the Lord and not walk in sin any longer. He says, these are the people, I am with you. He's going to be with those people. And then he goes on and says, he stirred up them with the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And what they do? They came and did work in the house of the Lord. I mean, they're busy working out their own salvation, building the spiritual house of God in them, doing what's right. Now we come to chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, that's the last day of tabernacles. This means this work has been, he's talking about a completed work now, this house being done, completed prophetically is what he's pointing towards. He speaks here to these ones, and the residue is the remnant, saying to them all, Who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? That's talking about the early church. There was glory in the first church. The glory of God manifests powerfully in the book of Acts. 
How do you see it now? The church now? <laughs> Where's the glory? It's not been around, has it? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as of nothing? Yet now be strong. You're going to get strong and do, not work, but it's the word a saw, which means to do. Be a doer of the word and see your house be built and become strong and mighty through the word. He said, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. You can't be afraid when all these other things are going on in the world. He said, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it's a little while, and I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. A tremendous shaking will come. He goes on in verse 7. I will shake all nations. All nations are going to be shaken in these last days. And the desire of all nations, which is Jesus coming to all nations, shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. This is the end time church he's talking about. They're going to be filled with the glory of God. The silver's mine, the gold's mine, meaning he's going to have the financial provision for this end time church. The glory of the latter house, the end time final church, shall be greater than of the former. Think about what went on in the early church in the book of Acts. It's going to be the book of Acts all over multiplied, increased, the greater glory. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. This is shalom, total completeness, wholeness, victory in all aspects of life is what this means. That's what he's going to bring forth. And then we come down here and he's talking later and he talks about the priests. And he talks about how if someone had flesh in the skirt of his garment and he touched bread, pottage, wine, or any of these things, would he be holy? And the answer is no. Otherwise, you, you, this, this, this shows you're not holy. And he goes on and asks another thing and it says that they're unclean. And then he comes down and he says in verse 14, so is this people. The people's unclean and people's not holy. So is this nation before me, saith the Lord. So is every work of their hands and that which they offer is unclean. People that are unclean are going to be in trouble. But God's going to do doing something about it. I pray you consider this day and upward from before a stone was laid upon the stone in the temple of the Lord, before the work began. Here, he speaks here that those days were when, when one was a heap of 20 measures there, but 10, otherwise there was no prosperity. And then he's drawing out 50, but there were but 20. Well, they weren't getting any prosperity whatsoever because they were unclean. They got smoked with blasting and mildew. They had all kind of judgments coming upon them, continue, and they wouldn't return to him. But now, he says, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, ah, now this is when Jesus came on the scene. He's the cornerstone of the temple, and you and I are living stones in this temple. Now, what's to happen? Is the seed yet in the barn, the vine, and the fig tree, and the pomegranate, all these trees, have they, they have not brought forth yet? But from this day, he says, I will bless you. And this is in the 4 and 20th day of the ninth month it's talking about, which is the time of the dedication of the church. And here he comes and he says it again, I will shake the heavens and the earth, paralleling the dedication of the church with the end time things that are going to happen in the seventh month. I will overthrow the throw of kingdoms, the judgments coming on the world. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. They're all going to be wiped out. I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horse and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. They're all going to be wiped out. In that day, saith the Lord, I'll take thee, he says, and I'll make thee as a signet. Now, when he talks about making you a signet, this means a mark of honor, a signet ring, which is a badge of royal authority possessed by kings. Meaning, you and I are going to become as a king. We are going to be shown forth that we have been ruling and reigning because we are walking in authority and victory and conquering every enemy in our life. And then he says, for I have chosen thee. Who's he going to choose? the ones that have responded to the call. Remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. Who's going to be chosen? 
the ones that have used their authority that God has made them as a signet ring, which is the kings with a badge of authority that they have ruled and reigned and they have conquered. Remember, the Bible says the one who conquers is the one who is going to inherit all things. That is what he wants. And he is going to pour out, a, the glory of God is going to be poured out mightily. And we'll look at one last scripture here before we stop. In Zechariah, chapter 6, verse 12. He said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch. Who's that? Jesus. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's building the temple? Jesus is. How? Through the word. In who? The ones that will hear and do the word. The church that's the remnant who will obey him. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and sit and rule upon the throne and shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between both of them. Total wholeness. Shalom. It's going to happen. The crowns. Oh, that's the crown for the victor. Is given to Helam, the ones who have strength, as the word means. To Debijah, the ones where they've seen the goodness of the Lord, Jehovah's good. To Jediah, the one where Jehovah has known, it means, the one he's known because they have developed a personal intimate fellowship and walked in his way. God knows the ones who are following him. He knows his sheep, remember. And to Hen, the one who has favor, the son of Zephaniah, who Jehovah has treasured. You and I are a peculiar treasure unto God as he accomplishes this great work for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And he says, They that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. Far off, that means all the generations from then on in the church age. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass, this building of the temple to bear the glory of God, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. That is what has to happen. Every single person must become a diligent doer of the word, obeying the voice of God to see God accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish. And he will do a great and mighty work. And tabernacles fulfillment will happen in the church. The glorious church will be coming forth in the midst of all the evil that's coming on the earth at the same time. But we will be protected. And we will be brought to the place where caught up to meet the Lord in the air in fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. We'll be there for the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven with him. We'll be coming back with him on the white horses when he comes to bring the judgment on the Day of Atonement. And then the final fulfillment of this will be the millennial reign of Jesus Christ beginning and we'll look at this just for a moment. In Revelation chapter 20, where he says, Blessed and holy is he of that part in the first resurrection on such that de second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There will be a millennial reign. That is tabernacles. It'll begin at the time of tabernacles. Jesus will begin to rule and to reign on earth for a thousand years. And you and I, are priests to be priests of God that have conquered and overcome and will be reigning with him. Then, of course, when the thousand years are expired, Satan's going to be loosed out of the prison. He's going to go out to deceive the nations and bring them against them. There will be nations because not everybody's going to be killed when the judgment comes on the nations. There'll be some that make it through and they'll start repopulating the earth over the thousand years. But then Satan's going to deceive them and they're going to come against God. They shall went up on the breadth of the earth to compass the saint, camp of the saints about the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Devoured them. They're all going to be destroyed. <clears throat> Anybody that fights, tries to fight against God is going to be eliminated. And the devil then will be cast into the lake of fire. Remember, he's going to be bound up for a thousand years in the bottomless pit during the, during the, during the millennial reign, but then he's going to be loosed. Now he's going to be finished. He'll be cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever. And the great throne judgment will come. And here, where the dead, small and great, stand before God, all the books, books about their works are open, 
Another book is open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things that are written in the books according to their works. That's why your works are important. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead that were in it. And they were judged every man according to his works. And the death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. And they will be done forever. But then the good news is that then there's going to be the Father coming. He's going to be coming to manifest himself with us. Of course, whoever is not found in the book of life gets cast into the lake of fire. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there's no more sea. There's not going to be any more sea. Now you can enjoy it while it's here, but it's not going to be after that. There won't be running. And he goes on and says, It's all the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And here, this is when the Father is going to come and dwell with us. A great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That's the final fulfillment of tabernacles. He will dwell with them. They shall be as God, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Tabernacles, a tremendous revelation of the work of God completed in the church to bring forth the glorious church. Those are the ones that will be in the millennial reign with Jesus for a thousand years, and then after that's over, then the, new, the heavens and earth will be burned up. There'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And we will be tabernacling with the Father in the new heavens, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. That's where we're headed. So you want to see this work be accomplished in your life. Put God first place. Walk in his ways. Do everything that he says. Remember, this will happen if everybody is diligently obeying the word of God and walking in his ways. You will see the work be done in you. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of tabernacles, of the work of God being accomplished in the end time church to bring it to maturity and fruitfulness and holiness and to be the glorious church which shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and be with the Lord forever and be in the millennial reign for a thousand years until the time comes when the new heavens and new earth will come forth and we will dwell with the Father in the new Jerusalem forever. I thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in my life. I put you first place. I will diligently obey with the fear of the Lord. I will work out my own salvation. I will be righteous and holy before you to be a part of the glorious church, to see you accomplish everything that you purpose in our life. I thank you for accomplishing this great work. And I will be ready for the coming of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We have more to talk about, about tabernacles and also about the personal fulfillment of this in your life, and we're going to talk more about that tonight. Father, we thank you for all that you have brought forth. Thank you for the revelation of the great work that is prophesied to come forth in the end time church and to see you bring forth this, this fruition of the work of Jesus Christ before he comes back to rule and reign. Father, we rejoice in this work that you're doing in us, and we will put you first place in all we do so that you accomplish this great work in us. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.